Then a reminder of the World Day of Prayer that's coming up on Friday, Friday afternoon at 2 p.m. in St. Nicholas Church. Uh, and this year we are praying with the women of Palestine, a very um, poignant time for us to be praying with them. Uh, so please do come along uh, if you would like to pray with us. Then the early service uh, every Sunday morning at 9.30 a.m. in Uphall South Church Hall if you want to come along for a bit of a different start to your Sunday morning. Then, folks, next Sunday is our communion Sunday. We'll be back in St. Nicholas for the month of March, and everyone who would like to are most welcome to join us 
and share in communion. Then a reminder of the care home services. There's one next Sunday afternoon as well at 3 p.m. in Broxton Care Home if you would like to come along uh, just to be a part of the service and to have some uh, conversation and chat with the residents, you're more than welcome to do that. Then folks, next Sunday as well, during our morning worship service, we'll have a visitor from Tier Fund who's going to come and tell us a bit more about the work that the charity does. Our congregation has a long history of supporting uh, Tier Fund. Some of you may be personally supporting Tier Fund on a monthly basis as well, but um, she will be along and she'll tell us a bit more about the work that Tier Fund is doing. Um, so next Sunday morning, during the morning worship, we'll hear more about that. We'll also have a retiring offering for Tier Fund, and all the donations that will be received will go directly to them to support the work that they do. Then, friends, uh, for this month, our Kirk session meeting has been moved to Zoom. Uh, that will be on Tuesday evening at, 20, uh, at 7 p.m., uh, just for all the Kirk session members. Then, folks, I also have a few extra, um, do I? No, I don't. I don't have any others. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I thought I had more, but that's it, luckily. <laughs> so uh, let us take a few moments. Uh, let us just come into the space. Maybe you've had a busy morning. Maybe this morning has not turned out the way that you would hoped it would. Um, perhaps you came running through the door, perhaps you were quite peaceful as you came through the door. Whatever uh, your heart is carrying, let us bring that before God. We imagine God's plan for us, our ideas of what a happy future looks like for us, for our family, for our community, and for the world. It will bring success and joy, glory, and praise. But will it? Often things turn upside down. We lose control. And there are unexpected consequences. But God invites us to learn to trust without clearly seeing. Only later do we recognize God's goodness to us. Dear friends, as we come and we gather in worship, may you become aware of God's presence and trust in God's goodness always. Amen. Our opening worship this morning is again two songs that we'll sing uh, back to back. Uh, if you're able, please stand for both these songs. If you do get tired and you want to have a sit down, please do that as well. Um, we're going to start our opening worship with praise. I will praise you, Lord, and then follow on with how deep the Father's love for us. Praise, I will praise you, Lord, and how deep the Father's love for us.
Let us join our hearts and our minds together as one. Let us pray. Loving God, you love and hold the universe in being. You treasure each of us as a work of art, a sign of your presence. When we haven't a clue what you are doing, help us to trust you, knowing that you see the whole picture. Faithful God, as we continue our journey of Lent, we come together as your family, your church, your people, to worship and to learn from you. None of us are too young or too old to follow you. All of us can still be surprised by new opportunities, new challenges, new ways to serve you. We are known by name and cherished as your children, whatever our age, whatever our circumstances, for you call and love us all. God of our days and nights, we are sorry for those moments when we see obstacles and you see stepping stones. We are sorry when we just see the years behind us and you see the years ahead. We are sorry for the times we put limits on what we feel is possible and lose sight of the fact that you are the God of the impossible. We are sorry when we shrink the world to our size and lose sight of the vastness of your compassion. We pray now that you will forgive us and help us to change our perspective. Merciful God, from upside down to the right way up, you change our lives and our perspectives. From being burdened by guilt to being freed by your grace, you change our lives and our perspectives. From the fear of death to the embracing of each moment, you change our lives and our perspectives. We thank you that all of this is possible because of your magnificent love and grace that we receive through our faith in Jesus, your one and only Son, who came to earth to become like us and to set us free. All these prayers we pray in his strong name, now along with the words that he also taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Uh, I'm going to tell us a story this morning that um, I found uh, that links to hopefully the message that uh, we'll see from Psalm 16 this morning. So I brought a few pictures along with me as well. One day long ago, there was a boy who lived in a land where no one had ever seen a horse. Everyone sort of knew what a horse looked like and what a horse did, but few people had ever seen a real horse not to mention ridden one. And there was a boy named Chris who had never seen a horse. And at school, the kids always tried to draw a horse in their art class. But nobody could really draw it very good because no one had ever gotten near enough to a horse to know what it really looked like. So one day, Chris was playing in an abandoned old church building and he came across a very old, dusty book. And as he started reading the book, he realized that he couldn't understand the old language in which it was written. However, he kept reading because he was sure that he would come across some words that he would understand if only he kept on reading. And so it was. One day he read in the book a few words, and then all of a sudden he spotted on a dusty page a picture of a very old door. And when he wanted to turn the page, he realized that he could actually open the door and go through it. He 
He reached out his hand and he opened the door and all of a sudden he was completely shocked because right in front of him, on the other side of the door, there was a real horse. Chris was so scared at the beginning and he continued to stare at it for the longest time. He tried to memorize every detail, but as soon as he was home between his friends, he forgot exactly what the horse looked like. But Chris went back again and again to look at this horse, and later on, he learned so much about the horse that he could even ride it. And at school, he got even better and better at drawing the horse in art class, not because he was particularly good at drawing, but it was just that he spent so much time with the horse. Not long after this, some of Chris's friends wanted to draw the horse as good as Chris could, and he told them, excitedly, all about the book with the door in it. And some of his friends started reading the book too. And soon enough, they saw the page with the door where they met the real horse. Other friends were simply happy enough to look at Chris's drawing. But the story tells us something about our own relationships with God. When we read the Bible and when we pray, it's like a door that we walk through to meet Jesus, because he really exists, and we can talk to him and we can see him with the eyes of our hearts. When we talk to Jesus a lot, we begin to think and live differently, and then others start to see the change in us, and they also want to get to know Jesus. But some other friends might simply just be happy to look at us. We're going to be thinking about that as we read Psalm 16 this morning, what it means for us to get to know God better and better, and how that changes us from the inside out. We're going to sing a song this morning, which I know we haven't sung a lot in church. Um, It's a song called King of Kings. If you don't know the words, um, feel free to just sit back and enjoy the words and the music as it comes up on the screen. This is King of Kings. And we're going to stay seated for this song.
I'd like to invite Wilma to come to the front. She's going to read for us Psalm 16. Thank you, Wilma. Psalm 16, a meek town of David. Keep me safe, my God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord, Apart from you, I have no good thing. I say of the holy people who are in the land, they are the noble one in whom is all my delight. Those who run after other gods will suffer more and more. I will not pour out libations of blood to such gods or take up their names upon my lips. Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body will also rest secure, because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful ones see decay. You make known to me the path of life. You fill me with joy in your presence with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Amen. And may God add his blessing. Thank you, Wilma, for doing that reading for us. David could earnestly write and sing these words of Psalm 16, um, I wonder if you could hear in the way that Wilma was reading it to us that it almost sounds as if there's a kind of a rhythm to it, that it was a song that was sung by David and by the people who followed after him because God was a reality to David. God was truly David's hiding place. God was really the one with whom David felt completely safe. Now the question for us naturally today is when we read a psalm like this, how did David manage this? How did it come about that God was such a reality to David that he could write these words about God? 
A key verse perhaps for us to start with this morning is verse 8 that says, I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. We know that David met with God. We know that David made time for God. And we know that he trusted God. And during Lent, the 40-day period before Easter Sunday for us, that started this year, uh, consequently on Valentine's Day and Ash Wednesday on the same day. During this time, this 40 days, we think about how Jesus' suffering and his death and his resurrection made it all possible for us to meet with God. Because of the cross and the resurrection, our prayers and our Bible are now both a door for us that leads to God's presence with us. And the Holy Spirit makes the Bible a living word for us in which we can dig deep with the sole purpose of meeting Jesus there. And when we do that, when we expect and with open hearts long to meet Jesus in the living words of the Bible, the Bible all of a sudden becomes more to us than simply a few words on a few hundred pages written thousands of years ago and which for so many people these days have now become outdated and irrelevant. But when we read this Bible with this attitude and of expectation to meet Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit in these pages, it becomes just that. It becomes the portal for us to the presence of God with us. And Jesus becomes the way to the Father for us. And when we meet with God like this, we are changed in several ways. And I'm just going to highlight a few this morning. The first is that we realize more and more that God, in fact, is very real. So real that we can echo David's words at the beginning of Psalm 1, where he says to God, Keep me safe, my God, for in you I take refuge. And nothing else. The second is that with every meeting, we learn more and more about God's love for us. The doubt about his love, and even if he really cares about us, becomes less and less within us. And then we can echo David's words in verse 2, where he says, I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. And we can really mean it when we say it. The third thing is that when we meet God through the Bible in this way, we get to know God's character more and more as well. Our own needs are pushed to the back of our focus and we focus more on what God wants. And we can say like Paul to the Philippians in chapter 3, what is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining the resurrection from the dead. The fourth thing is that when we meet God like this, we realize more and more that we die to our own desires, our own dreams and ideas about how we think things should look. And when we let that part of ourselves die away and we focus on God, God can change us from the inside out, changing our thoughts and renewing our minds. And Romans 12 told us the promise that uh, for us that when we sacrifice our own needs on God's altar, God will change our hearts and our minds, renew them. Then we will be able to discern what his will is what is good and acceptable and pleasing to God. And then we will be able to say wholeheartedly with David in verses 7 and 11, 
I will praise the Lord who counsels me, even at night my heart instructs me. And you make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. A practical example for us of this would be that we didn't get an imagination from the Lord for no reason. We can try to visualize for ourselves that we bring every little part of ourselves before God all our dreams, the way that we think, everything that we want, we can bring it before God and ask God what it is that he wants us to do, what it is that he wants us to see, what it is that he wants us to focus on and to think about. And when we do this, when we submit to God in this way, not because that we can't think or dream for ourselves, but because we believe that God has something special for us that he wants us to know, We open ourselves up to be changed by God. I hope you can hear it's a difference in mindset, a difference in attitude, not only thinking about what it is that we want, but truly longing to know what it is that God wants. The last thing is that in our meetings with God, our spiritual eyes and ears start to open up. As Paul prays in Ephesians 1, our eyes open up so that we can know what, God, what hope God calls, um, God's call hold for us and how wonderful the inheritance is that he has in mind for us, that we already have this because of his grace and his love for us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Then we can truly say with verses 5 and 6 in Psalm 16, With David, we can say, Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places, and surely I have a delightful inheritance. So these five things is the way that we change when we approach the word of God with an open heart and an open mind, wanting to know more and more about what God's will for us is. For the rest of the uh, reflection this morning, I'm going to focus on verse 6, where it says, The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. Our inheritance is not solely um, our wonderful families or maybe our fancy cars or our comfortable pensions or our lovely houses that we live in. Our inheritance is what Jesus did for us on the cross. And we can ask, what is that? And to some extent, we are still trying to figure out exactly what that means. But a few things are already sure and certain for us. One is that our inheritance is to meet with our Father, because we are now reconciled with him through Jesus. And we can speak to God and pray to God for ourselves. Ephesians 2 verse 18 tells us this, For through him we have both access to the Father by the Holy Spirit. The second is that our inheritance is a gift of eternal life. We know this sure and true. For Jesus says that he is the resurrection and the life. If we believe this, we start to realize that our inheritance in what our inheritance in Jesus is. And then we can say with David in verses 9 and 10, Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body will rest secure, because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. But how do we know that this inheritance which God promised us is truly ours? In Ephesians 1, we read, You were also included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possessions to the praise of his glory. Now the good news for us is that we do not have to wait for this inheritance to come someday. We already have it through the work of the Holy Spirit within us. 
because it is God's wish that we are freed from sin, that we are set free completely to lighten our hearts and to let us live in his all-encompassing peace now here on earth already. So when we meet with God, we can truly say, like David, you are my Lord. Jesus paid the ultimate price to set you free to belong to God. And in the New Testament, we have so many references to this fact. But one is highlighted in Titus 2, verse 14, where it affirms that Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify us for himself, to become his very own people, eager to do what is good. Peter also affirms this when he says that we are the chosen people of God, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that we may declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. The fact that we are his own children gives us the stability and the trust and hope, even in the midst of all of our ups and downs through, the, through life. And even more than that, even when it feels like life is kicking us in the teeth, and we may be feeling like it's unfair and that we will struggle to be happy again. The fact that you belong to God may also mean something completely different to you than it does to the person who is sitting right next to you. For the more you learn about God's character, the more precious it becomes to you. This knowledge that you belong to God, and this becomes a massive comfort during our most difficult circumstances in life, because we know that God never leaves us or forsakes us. He who has started a good work in us will see it through to the end. Now, to be God's property, to be his children, naturally also places a massive responsibility on our shoulders. As his children, we are called to have the same attitude as God to be a true reflection of who he is. And this is why our meetings with God are so important, so that we can be changed to become more like him. In 2 Corinthians um, chapter 3, verse 18, Paul writes and he says, And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory through the Lord who is the Spirit. Now naturally, some critical thinkers among us may think this sounds very self-serving. All this seeking to meet with God, to be freed from sin, and to learn to get to know God's love and God's heart, to experiencing Him on a, on a deeper level, is this not solely a selfish act? Yes, there are some of us who may feel like we are doing only this to save our own necks or our our own souls from death. But if you think about it like this, you are missing the whole point about why God is even remotely interested in you in the first place. He wants to see the fullness of Jesus' salvation take its hold on you, and to let you live through that freedom, and to go even further than that, and to make this salvation visible to all those around you, in and through you. God is so wonderful that while you are being transformed from glory to glory, every time you meet God in the Spirit, you are also capable of serving and representing the Lord truthfully in this world. Like the story we heard earlier, where Chris could only draw a true picture of what the horse really looked like after he had seen it a number of times. So only can we be the true images of God wherever we are in this world when we keep meeting with God and with Jesus regularly through praying and through reading the Bible not only in our safe places and among people that we know really well, but also perhaps at the golf club or at the gym or in our pottery classes or our knitting groups or in our jobs 
or in the company of friends who know nothing and want nothing to do with God, or even in our own families where it sometimes feels really difficult to live with Jesus' attitude when we are being laughed at or ignored because of our faith. It almost makes me want to put a wee footnote at the end of verse 11 of Psalm 16 where it says, you make known to me the path of life and add in the wee footnote and you teach me how to live it. When we meet with God and when we follow David's example, when we earnestly seek the heart of God, we become more and more aware of his calling on our lives. And in this way, we receive the grace to do our work well and to do it with joy, even with eternal pleasures if we believe what David is writing. And in this way, we intertwine the calling on us to give shape to the kingdom of God here on earth with our day jobs, whether it is looking after our grandkids or working in an office or teaching children or enjoying life in retirement. And we live our lives the way that God wants us to. Our prayer is simply this morning, after we've read Psalm 16, is that this will be your heart's deepest desire. For without your willingness to meet with God, to open your heart to him, God cannot do anything. For he will never force himself on you. He wants you to want to know him. And my prayer is that you will. Amen. Our next hymn that we're going to sing together is Christ is Alive, Let Christians Sing. Let us now join our hearts and our minds together as one. Eternal God, how wonderful and vast are your horizons. Thank you for making us in your image. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for calling us to be your disciples. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for empowering us to fulfill our calling. Thank you, Holy Trinity, for the expanse of your love and the depth of your faithfulness. Incredible God, we thank you and praise you for trusting us, even when we find it hard 
to trust in you. We thank you and praise you for offering for us more than we could ever imagine. We thank you and praise you for making the impossible possible. We thank you and praise you for all the blessings of youth and of age. Lord, even when we don't understand, help us to keep on trusting you. There is so much going on in our world that we simply don't understand. There are wars and rumors of wars, famine, natural disasters, corrupt leaders, injustice, global warming. The more we pray, the more we could keep adding to this list. Lord, help us to hold on to the fact that you are in control that ultimately you are God. We bring specific areas of concern to you now as we pray for Gaza and Israel, for Ukraine and Russia. We pray for your loving hand to be on the people who are suffering and we ask you to bring them comfort and security. Lord, we pray for your peace to rule in this world. And even when we don't understand, help us to keep trusting you. Lord, there is so much going on in our neighborhoods that we don't understand. There is unrest and waiting lists in our hospitals that seem endless. Lord, it seems as if there is never any contentment and very little joy. And when we turn to you, we hear you speaking of suffering and rejection. As followers of Jesus, you explain that our true joy comes only from denying ourselves. Sometimes it all seems so confusing and topsy-turvy. Sometimes following you is hard. And that we admit that there are times that we just don't understand. Yet you love us through all this turmoil. And you care for us deeply and long for us to see things from your perspective. We pray, Lord, give us your insight and your wisdom. Lord, there's even so much going on within ourselves that we simply don't understand. We fall sick. Some people are cured and some are not. And there often doesn't seem to be any explanation why. We pray for those amongst us who are suffering in any way, now in the silence of our hearts. We we remember those who are sad and sorrowful, those who are lonely and anxious or depressed. We pray for those waiting for treatment or a diagnosis. Lord, we don't understand illness and disease. And we pray for those whose faith is tested by their troubles. Give them courage to face their situations and show us how to be empathizers, how to be good listeners, and how to be there when we are needed. But most of all, we pray for your comfort and your love to be felt by all who need your touch today. Lord, we know that to serve you well, we are called to deny ourselves and to take up our crosses and to follow you. But it is hard, and it would be so much, so much simpler to be your followers if you promised us an easy life. Yet we know that you have promised to be with us, You have promised to uphold us. You have promised your spirit to help and to guide us. So we come and we offer ourselves to you afresh today, even when it's hard, even when we don't know where we're going, even when we just don't feel like it. Help us to turn our eyes on you, to look beyond ourselves to those who need our help, to look beyond ourselves and see those who we can serve, to look beyond ourselves and to see where we can make a difference in our homes, our communities, our workplaces and schools, and yes, even in our world. We pray that you will go before us and give us courage, 
that you will shine into our dark moments and lead us onward so that we can help spread your kingdom wherever you call us to go. For what we have and for who we are, we are also truly grateful, for we know that it all comes from you. We bring back today and offer to you what we can of our offerings of money, and we pray that it may be used to build your kingdom here on earth. All these are prayers we offer to you, O God, like sweet perfume, in the name of Jesus Christ, our risen and living Lord, who deserves with you and the Holy Spirit all our honor and our praise. Amen. Our final hymn this morning is the beautiful hymn, To God Be the Glory. Let us stand, if we're able to sing this together, To God Be the Glory. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you and all whom you love this day and forevermore.
done for me Good to go.